All right, I want to welcome you to our Preach With You. Um, here with Ben Weatherston from the Grand Rapids Church of Christ, um, which is about an hour or so away from where I'm at. And so Ben and I are great friends and uh, help each other, support each other. And um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to go through this. I know it's a little late. Some people probably have already preached this, but you know, summertime, it's hard to get this stuff all uh, around, but uh, I know that the videos are getting watched. The Treasuring God series, I think, will live on for a couple of summers. Uh, the churches that use the booklet have been uh, really excited about how it's kept their church united, which is kind of the whole goal of it, um, even as, as we enter the vacation season and people are kind of spread out in a diaspora of fun. Uh, I don't know, uh, but uh, so it's great. Um, and uh, I'm preaching this this Sunday. So I already wrote my notes using Ben's notes as a springboard, and uh, and so it'll be interesting to to see um, you know how I even change my message. So I'm excited about this. I do want to say uh, Ben is uh, the graphics guy he, for our uh, preach with you and rooted uh, messages. And so if you if you thought the the graphics the first five sermon series we had were really good, uh, it's because Ben is amazing at that. And if you thought that the graphics had kind of fallen off the last couple of months, that's because I took over. <laughs> and you're right. Uh, it's not as good. Uh, so, uh, so, but thank you so much for that, Ben. I know so many small church leaders were so grateful for those graphics and people were hunting them down. I get texts like, hey, where's, where's that graphics folder? I need to, I want to put together my PowerPoint. And it gives uh, all these small churches so much credibility uh, when, when the graphics on the PowerPoint and for our you know, social media and cards and all that, um, the, it all looks good. Um, I love seeing like the Madison church, they've got all of the rooted logos that you made just thrown onto one band. <laughs> I know that wasn't the intention, but it, it works. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, super grateful, man. And, uh, and so, yeah, talking to Ben here, he's, he has, uh, and he's an amazing preacher and teacher and a thinker and has, uh, I think, a style that's unique uh, among preachers um, in, our, in our fellowship, for sure. Um, and maybe part of that's his background, not being in the ministry for a long, long time, and then coming to the ministry. And, um, but yeah, Ben, you want to talk a little bit about your, um, your style? Oh, man. I don't, I don't even know if I can put, um, put it to words. I, I haven't had to explain it much. But um, I just, I, what you were saying earlier about um, not being in the ministry, we didn't, we didn't go into the ministry until I was 40. And up until then, I got, I got baptized at 23, and I was just a messy Christian trying to figure stuff out. Um, and, and then, and then I, then I was kind of thrust. I, I always tried to be the guy that was like helpful to them, whoever my minister was like, Hey, if you need me to do a communion or preach on a Sunday, I tried to be helpful. But then I was the guy that was preaching uh, every Sunday. And, um, you know, we were also leading campus. And so sometimes I was preaching every Sunday, Wednesday and Friday. And, um, and so I think as I look back over my life it, before ministry, I tried to think about like, do I remember any of the sermons? Um, and what were the ones that were most helpful to me as the disciple? Like not, I mean, like helpful, like not just inspirational. Cause I have this attitude that's a little cynical towards inspiration. <laughs> and I've been known to trash a Ted talk or two because I'm like, eh, yeah, it doesn't do anything though. It doesn't actually help. And so I guess I just try to think um, when, I'm, when I'm putting together a sermon, I'm like, okay, I have this small window of time where I can influence in a little, in a, just a nudge. Like we can just nudge uh, the congregation. Um, and so then like, how can I best use that time? Because I'm not going to revolutionize the world. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like revolutionize my church. 
all I can do is kind of give people a tiny little push. And I think what's, what's actually really good is if a, if a preacher, if a minister realizes that, and then instead of trying to like overshoot and do too much in a sermon, yeah, if it's best to, to just like time those nudges for the, for the most impact. And so I feel like maybe in our fellowship, but in other denominations as well, like the minister used to feel like a very large rudder and the congregants were small ships. And so if the minister said something, it was like, boom, everybody in the whole congregation was just like, <laughs> um, I think in recent years, some of the, you know, documentaries and podcasts of like um, churches that grew very fast, but did so at the cost or expense of people's health have shown that that's not good. And so now I really do, I really do see myself as a very small rudder and everyone in my congregation is a very large ship. And so that just means like, if I want to see change, well, yeah, I have to do my part, which is to change direction. But then I also have to invest with them relationally for the time that it's going to take. If you're a big ship and a little rudder, you know, it's going to take a long time to, to change direction. And so I think through that stuff and I'm like, okay, here's the change I want to see. What do I have to do? And then how much time is it going to take? And it doesn't mean that someone can't like instantly re repent and change direction, but as a congregation, I just know that that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so my preaching, not to like confuse metaphors, but if you think about like at a, at a, at a park where there's a huge fountain with all the little boats in the, the kids play with in the water. Um, I literally think of, I, I think of myself as just like a hand on the side of the water. That's just kind of like pushing the, the stream along. And if I do that consistently and I don't give up and I, and I invest in the time in my church, then I can create kind of a current where the, the boats will be carried. Cause like, and that's kind of like the church culture, like this is our, this is our church culture, but there's no way to rush that. And there's no way to manufacture that other than just gentle, consistent. So that's, that's what Sunday preaching is. It's just me kind of saying, Hey guys, here's where we're going. Here's my vision for our church. And here's some things to think about. And at the same time, I'm just always thinking like, man, is what I'm going to say, can it actually help you? Or is it just going to, is it just going to be some like emotional flash in the pan like oh yeah but then it's not there it doesn't help it's, it doesn't give you anything practically and so a couple of things that i always think about are specifically is um conversation starters like man in in a perfect world like i'm, I'm just thinking of like two brothers two married brothers or whoever in my mind there's two married brothers they have a conversation sometime during the week and they used one of the questions that I asked in the lesson as kind of the seed or the starter for that conversation. Or even if one, you know, it's not like, hey, what did you think? But it's almost like, hey, when Ben said this, this is what I thought. And then that starts a conversation. So I'm trying to, trying to always think like, man, could, could the things that I say from the pulpit on Sunday could those be great seeds for discipling times, for encouragement times, for that sort of thing? And that kind of guides how I, I, I structure a sermon. Yeah, that's great. You know, I think uh, what I'm hearing is a lot of humility, uh, which is wonderful. And then um, I know, you know, one thing that you do such a good job of is you're very intentional. And so one sermon or even one series, they really, the way you put your, you know, your year together and your preaching schedule, they really build off of each other. Uh, you use like, you're really good with sticky phrases, you know, things, you know, that change church culture, um, like your church um, speaks a different language that you've influenced 
you know, pushing the, the boats. <clears throat> um, yeah, vocabulary, yeah. common vocabulary is common really important. Vocabulary, yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, you do, a, you do a great job with that. And so we only get, uh, you know, one message right here. So, you know, people will miss that. But if you, if you get a chance, I would encourage you to watch a whole series um, of Ben preaching from the Grand Rapids Church. And, uh, and you'll see um, really, really intentional um, shepherding, I would say, from the pulpit. So um, I'm always encouraged, man. Um, awesome. awesome. Hey, well, let's, uh, let's get into this um, message here, treasuring the word. And you were assigned a, a psalm and some gospel and uh, and you got it here. So, um, yeah, talk to us about how you open this up. Well, so the funny thing is I, I wrote the, I wrote the notes and then when I actually wrote my sermon, like when I made my, uh, keynote or whatever, uh, I, I actually bailed on the Psalm, which You're like, uh, this is I, trash. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I had too much stuff. Like something's uh -huh. gotta go. Yeah. Um, but I, but I left it in the notes. There, there's probably in my, in my opinion, my my notes might seem sparse to some people, but that's probably too much for what I think would be a good uh, sermon. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, I would probably try to cut something out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I I did it, I I just started with this contrasting idea. Uh, this is how we actually started. So in our church, we started treasuring God with this treasuring the Word. And I started with this question, like, if I asked you, do you treasure God? Um, you're probably going to say yes, because that's the easy Christian answer. But, but what if we broke the nature and the complexity and the who God is into these different parts? And I asked you, how are you doing treasuring these other things? You might have to challenge yourself and admit, oh, maybe I don't treasure God as much as I Right. thought I did. And so that's kind of how we intro it. And then we've been continuing that. Um, and so th then I used this sermon as a way to illustrate that. So I said, you know, treasuring God includes treasuring all these other things, including treasuring the word. Now, if I said, do you do you treasure the word? The good Christian answer is yes, I treasure the word. Um, but then I, I, I said, well, if, if, Jesus, if Jesus Christ was the logos of God, and he's the word, and we, and we start with John 1, and the word became flesh, and Jesus is walking around, and we read the Bible, and we read the gospels of all these people that say the dumbest stuff to Jesus, or that they don't get it, or they, or they just leave him. Uh, we can think, oh, those silly people, if I, if I had Jesus face to face, if I got to spend years with Jesus, I would have responded appropriately. I right. would have totally been like, he's the Messiah, do what he says, you can trust him. Um, and yet, this very interesting parallel of Jesus is the word makes me wonder, the way they responded to the person of Jesus, can we see some parallels between the way we respond to the word, the written word that we have? Yeah. And so that was kind of the, the uh, overall idea of this sermon. Look at three instances where people did not respond well to the face-to-face -face Jesus, yeah. and then be honest and say, you know what, I actually respond the same way to the logos in terms of the Bible. And there's, there's lots of fine print. If you're, if you're a, a very um, academic minister, preacher, you can, you can do all the fine print of like, hey, we know that the logos is more than just the Bible, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's totally fine, do that. Um, but we, I basically just started with the Jesus is the word. That was my premise. Yeah. There were people that had bad interactions, they responded inappropriately, I think is the phrase that I keep saying. They responded inappropriately to the person of Jesus. They're in the exact same way. There are ways that we respond inappropriately to the written word of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that. I think, you know, and it goes both ways because I, I think you, 
um, we read the Bible inappropriately when we read it as a book, when mm -hmm. right off the bat, John one, you know, says it's more than a book. It's, you know, you're meeting with Jesus in, in a sense, um, when you read the Bible. Um, and so I thought that was really valuable. Just like if we're going to treasure the word that isn't like, we think, okay, yeah, I'm going to treasure my Bible. No, we're going to treasure the word. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. that's Jesus in scripture. Um, and so I think it makes it more personal. It makes it more real. Um, and so those are some of the, the, you know, things I thought, and then, and then, you know, just like a relationship with a person, you can go off, you know, you can be inappropriate. You can, you can react the wrong way. And I think that personalizing it, um, is really helpful. So, uh, and I would say, yeah. here's a, here's a great, here's a great footnote for, for preachers. <clears throat> it's, it's easy to go too um ethereal academic and yeah. if someone doesn't walk away with thinking my relationship with the bible and they walk away confused with my relationship with the word that can be that can go against everything you're trying to do in terms of being helpful and so for some people in your congregation you're wanting them to walk away with the uh, understanding of like i need to have a better relationship with my Bible. Mm -hmm. And if you overshoot it, then you can actually undercut that. And so I try to think like, man, there's, there are some people in your congregation that are probably, I don't know, like simpler, like they don't like very uh, rich convoluted thinking, like they need it simpler. And if and, and so I'm always trying to think like, am I preaching to that person too, as much as the the guy that with two right. masters that loves deep thinking and so i would just always caution people like don't overshoot the yeah the theology so that it's not like practically helpful right or another way to think about it is like if you had your teens in service that's a great way to think about it if you had your teens in service would they be like i get it and and walk away with something yeah i love that well and i think about you know like when I, I feel like I'm at my best when I am just looking forward to my devotional time. Um, like even these, you know, little treasuring God devotionals that are, they're so simple, but I look forward to it every morning. I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, and I, cause I feel like I'm meeting with a person, like I'm meeting with Jesus. It's more than just, I'm doing a daily reading. And so yeah. I feel like that's not, you know, academic. That's just like, it's just what it's supposed to be like so and you did a good job yeah. you know presenting that so let's so talk the way about, i the yeah, way i end here the way i end yeah. the um the intro is i said and i actually wrote this out in case i forgot while i was preaching i said uh <clears throat> there are he had interactions with people that misunderstood a lot of what he was saying and what he was trying to do and we read them and we think those people are dumb. If I was with Jesus, I obviously would have responded the right way. Right. Well, right. We're going to look at three interactions Jesus had with people that can help us make sure we were acting appropriately with the word. Uh, for every mistake they made back then talking to Jesus, we can find those same mistakes in our relationship with the Bible. Yeah. So then we jump into each one. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, go for it. The first, the first one you've got here is being defensive or offended. Yeah. And I, I kind of put both of those down so that the ministers could do whatever they wanted with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my title slide for that first point was defensive. And I actually went out of order from my notes for my actual sermon. Okay. So my first point was defensive. My second point was impatient. And my third point was taking a break. Um, but so I started, um, with defensive in John eight and yeah. And I, and, but I did use the word offended a lot in that point, like, because I think it's important for people to realize that, um, you know, especially in our political climate or our ideological environment, uh, it's easy for us to call the other side of whatever line we draw in the sand as like, well, they're easily offended, but I'm not easily offended. Right, right. I think both sides, I, I think everybody is easily offended. Um, but what I put forth in John 8 was the, uh, if you, you, if you hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. And 
I, what I say is like, man, Jesus said it this way for a reason throughout, throughout the gospels, Jesus likes to kind of poke people mm-hmm. in whatever prideful corner of their heart they they think is okay. Jesus is like, well, let's, let's check that out. And then he pokes them. Right? We have a, a phrase that we've started using. This is common vocabulary example. Mm-hmm. Uh, stabbing, stabbing someone in the pride, <laughs> like yeah. Jesus stabs them in the pride. And then, and then be honest and be like, man, that stabbed me in the pride. <laughs> so you, what you're saying is like, yeah, that hurt, but I hurt because of my, my sin and my reaction. And so what we said, it said it here is like, yeah, Jesus said this to these people. And then it started this conversation that went really bad. If you read the rest of John 8, like he's, yeah. all he says is, if you hold to my teaching, right. then you're my disciples, then you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. And within the course, like that's the, this is the conversation that started with to the Jews who had believed him. Yeah. And then it ends with, and they picked up stones to stone him. Yeah. It's like, how, man, how can you have one conversation where it goes from like, yeah, Jesus is cool to, oh, this guy has to die. And it's because Jesus was like, all right, I'm just going to keep exposing your pride. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, he, and I, I make sure to, to say that like he could have said it different. If he really wanted to be more gentle, he could have. But he was like, man, there's something in your heart and I'm going to bring it out right now. Yeah. And, and so when you have an interaction with the word of God, like, are you letting your pride be revealed? And then I ask that question. So my notes, I'm, I, I am like full, I fully admit, like my Sunday slides are super formulaic and boring to some people. <laughs> but it's like, if I could sum it up, it's like, here's my title slide. Boom, one word or, or a couple words. It's like, this is what I want you to think about for the next five to seven minutes or so. And then here's my scripture and I'll, I'll ask people to read the scripture, but here it is. This is, this is the, if you didn't bring your Bible, I, I, here it is on the screen. And then, um, and then I close out each point with like a sentence or a question. And it's like, this is, if you get like, I don't want it to be ambiguous. What I want you to take away from this point, right? Like here it is. And I'm going to ask you, and sometimes I'll ask it in the, first person like do I um do this and I want and I'm gonna read it like that but I want you to read it like that and I want everybody in the congregation to think for one second about this question and so for this issue for this point the question was do I allow the bible to reveal pride in my heart and then deal with it appropriately and I and and that's you know that's two things yeah it's do I, do I let the Bible stab me in the pride? Um, or do I, do I just read the Bible, you know, hoping to be comforted and encouraged? And I never, I never let it go into the really uncomfortable parts. Because um, if I do that, then I am, I'm having an, an inappropriate interaction with the word of God. Like I look at Jesus in his ministry and he is like stabbing people left and right in the pride. And so I have to have that. I have to have that interaction with the word of God. Yeah. But then there's the second part. So I let it stab me in the pride. And then what do I do? Close it and be like, this is stupid. (laughs) Right. Or do I, or do I then I deal with it appropriately? And so the examples that I use are like the parable of the sheep and the goats. Like that is a that is a parable that should cut you every single time you read it, and if it doesn't, my guess is that you are you're blind to how like convicting it is. Um, you know the fruit in the vine. Um, am I producing fruit? Like that should cut us every time we read it, and if if we use those verses to to comfort ourselves only and say, yep, see, I'm right. And everybody else is wrong. Well, then, then we're having an inappropriate reaction with the word of God. We are just like the people, uh, that, 
that saw Jesus face to face and didn't get what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we, we give into the anger of those things and, you know, shut our Bible and be like, this is stupid. So that was, that was point one, number one, do we get defensive? Um, and so I think part of my job, and I, and I would even say this from the pulpit, like part of my job is to, to facilitate this, to present you with the, the parts of the Bible that do cut us. Stab them. And so, yeah. yeah. And so if you, if you come to church only wanting to be comforted and encouraged, like you, I think you're missing part of what Jesus was trying to do. Um, and so I think every sermon should have warnings, conviction, uh, maybe a, a little bit about that, that pride response or that fear response, like, Ugh, but then hope and love and, you know, but Jesus is died for our sins and that sort of stuff. So the defensiveness, that was point number one. Yeah, I love it. You know, and I think one of the things you, you had in your notes too is the hinge that, that or the, maybe the, the point of the stab um, that Jesus gives is just the word free. Um, you know, and that's mm -hmm. such a famous and inspirational quote now, you know, MLK quote, you know, the truth will set you free and uh, free at last, you know, we think about, you know, that in, in our society, I think is so bent on freedom, um, you know, either, either, you know, way you look at it, um, people want freedom and, uh, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, it's, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, and so and then I love that, you know, in their, their response right away when their, their pride gets riled up is, is they, they lie. They, you know, they're like, we've, we've always been free. We've never been slaves. And that's just not true. If you read the old Testament, if you look they know their history, yeah, they knew it. You know, but but even, they had, if you were going to do, yeah. if you were going to do a sermon just on this verse, which you obviously can. And, and I love what comes after it with, you know, you know, calling murderers and, you know, it's like, it escalates quickly. Oh, yeah. He's it's demon possessed. Hilarious. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but if you could do a, a sermon just on this passage, one of the things is that Christians, comfy Christians can do the exact same response when it comes to their slavery to their sin. Yes. We can, we can think like, well, I've never been, I've never been a slave to anybody. It's like, we can forget that we were enslaved to our flesh and our sin yep. and uh and how bad that is if we when we forget it yeah it's the it's the same um we do we do the exact the same, same thing what do you mean i'm not and i think christians have that same reaction what do you mean i'm not free um like yeah so uh it's amazing how our hearts have not changed and jesus is stab wounds still cause us to bleed out sometimes um mm -hmm. So uh, the next, and then, so you move on and you said you changed it a little bit. Um, your second. Yeah, I went to John 10 for the next point. Okay. And then do you go back to John six for the third one? Okay. Yeah. So we'll just do that. So I went to impatient. Yep. And I called this impatient. And this is an interesting one. Some people are going to love this point. Some people are not going to remember it when they walk out the door, but um you know, the scripture in John 10, starting in 24, is basically, how long will you keep us in suspense? Tell us plainly. Yeah. Like, we're tired of the gray. I'm tired of the parables. I'm tired of the, the ambiguity. I'm tired of the mystery. Like, are you the Messiah or are you not the Messiah? Right. And what's funny is, he still answers them with like a certain amount of ambiguity. <laughs> yeah. and, and I love that Jesus is perfectly content throughout all the gospels is perfectly content with lots of mystery. Right. And there are some like theological um, guesses as to why like the spiritual battle while he was on earth was raging. And if, if the devil knew exactly what you know his plan was to die and you know be crucified then there's all of those guesses as to why jesus was so okay with like not telling them plainly but i think it's important it would 
we, we boil this just down to like, man, Jesus is okay with a certain amount of mystery where we want everything to be like so clean cut, clear process system, understandable, like give me a white paper that clearly explains how everything's going to work. And then we'll, I'll, you'll get my buy-in. And Jesus is like, yeah, none of that. Like, right. If you come along with me, you're always going to be kind of guessing. <laughs> and we see that in John 10, when we see his, you know, again, they tried to kill him. <laughs> his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. And, uh, and the, the people around him saw no value in, in his parables, in his, in his ambiguity, in his, in his mystery. And so the, the, the question that I ask uh, is like, well, what about us? You know, I think almost every sermon has to include that, that question. What about us? Um, we see something in the Bible, but what, how, do, how do we do the same thing? Or how does that relate to us? And usually, when, well, when, in, this, in this specific point, the question that I asked was, how do I handle the messiness of mystery? And, and right away, you know, some people are going to be like, mm, I don't know, I don't get it. And so this is, this is a, po a point, I admit, this is a point that's not for everyone in your church. But some people are really going to, like, appreciate this point. Yeah. Um, do, do I want the Bible, do I want the word of God to be like crystal clear, black and white, no ambiguity? Uh, whenever I read it, I, I'm reading, I'm reading Genesis. I want the, I want the creation account to be clear about how everything was made. I want, I read the, you know, I read the Joshua and I want the, I want the why. Why does everybody need to be killed? And if, if I don't get the why, then I'm not going to be happy with my relationship with the word of God right. or any cultural issue today. Like I read this, I need to know exactly like how this fits and the word of God needs to be sharp and crystal clear. Um, I used an example of when I was a baby Christian I remember using Acts 2, 44. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. I actually used that verse to, to do damage um, when I was like a young Christian. I remember telling someone like, hey, you know, your church and my church don't, aren't, we don't have everything in common. <laughs> Um, and uh, even like family members that, that, that really hurt. Mm. And, and what's funny is now I'm so glad, this is why I'm glad I wasn't in ministry back then, <laughs> like <clears throat> where my damage would have been compounded. Um, because now I preach almost the opposite that we don't have to have everything in common. Now, how do I wrestle with that, with the word of God that says that about the first century, um, well, that's the, the messiness of mystery in the Bible. There are going to be things where we encounter something when we read the, the Bible, and it, it reminds us, oh, man, the, the kingdom is mysterious. And do I go, well, that's stupid. I want everything like ch -ch -ch easy. Or we read something about, you know, the, how God's nature is very mysterious. I mean, do I want it boiled down into a very simple theology? Or we read something about the, how Jesus is mysterious, the mysteries of Jesus, and I, and I now, but I need him to be redefined to fit my culture, my time, my ideology, my politics. And it's very easy to do, and it's we're making the same mistake that they made in John uh, ten. And so yeah. this is kind of a, I admit this is a little bit of a throwaway point that some people are just not going to get it, but at the same time. This is, as a minister, this is something that you can go back to and remind people of when they 
having a dispute with someone um and they 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 play that like well, i don't see how christians could do this and be like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. <laughs> right there's there's a messiness in the mystery of the kingdom of god that that we're not going to be able to like easily systematize and so right. um, and so that's that's pretty much all this point is is like man do we get impatient do we want things to be super clear and we throw away anything that points to ambiguity or, or mystery yeah um, I love it. I hope it's not a throwaway point for our church because our, our uh, September series and the next Preach With You um, series is called Messy Church. Um, and mm. uh, um, the fourth sermon is actually Messy Bible. And, uh, and oh, I just awesome. think, you know, right along with, um, with freedom, it, you know, people, people just cling to freedom and believe they can be free without Christ um, and cling to worldly things that promise freedom but don't deliver. I think yeah. that, um, that people in the same way struggle with nuance. Um, they're not okay with gray area messiness. Um, they yeah. want, you know, the, they want the, the security of being right, uh, which is also known as pride. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and Jesus himself didn't even bring that, you know, in, in the Bible, if we're going to treasure the word of God, um, it's not uh, just a list of rules or, or a checklist that, can make you feel good when you do all the things the thing is we'd never feel good because we never do all the things but um it's you know it's got poetry and um uh, letters that weren't written to us um it's history um apocrypha it's it's beautiful it's there's so much nuance that's part of why it's timeless and uh and so i think you know if we really want to grow and see our you know if we're treasuring the word as Jesus and seeing it as a relationship that we have, um, then I think we have to really value sitting and not knowing. Um, yep. And it's even harder because we, we pre can pretty much get the answer to everything immediately, um, you know, for the first time in the history of the world through our phones. Uh, so I think impatience is definitely uh, spreading and uh, that, does, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. So I think it's a, I think it's a great point. I loved it. I, you know, I expanded upon it a little bit. And so, all right, let's talk about um, the third point here. Second point, if you're using Ben's notes, um, but the third point about giving up, taking a break, I think you changed it. Yeah, that's what I ended up calling it. Um, so I just put that up on the screen, taking a break. And I say that there are ways that we can interact with the word of God that basically make us quit. We call it quits. We stop listening. We're done. Yeah. And, and you might think, no, <laughs> no, I don't do that. Right. Um, but I use in John six. And so I make sure like we're going back to this, this time where Jesus has all of these people following him and he stops and he turns around and he says the most ridiculous thing he could possibly have said. Right. And it just makes people go like, nah, I'm done. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the whole idea of like, he draws the crowd, he teaches the crowd, but then he thins the crowd and he's like, Hey, are you guys serious? Let me let me see if you're serious by dropping this mysterious, ambiguous, you know, parable thing. And so what he says in John 6, 56 is whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that's crazy. And then he says, it says, uh, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then aware that his disciples were grumbling, he doesn't like massage them. He stabs them again. He's like, does this offend you? Uh, he double down on this. Yeah. You, you can't come to me unless the father has enabled you. And it says from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so there's that group of people, the people that, that were like, nah, this is dumb i'm done and they turned away and then he then he turns to the 12 and he's like hey do you guys want to leave too and simon's uh and peter's answer was like who who can we go to right 
you have the words of eternal life. And so a couple of the things that I explain about the story is that Jesus is purposefully giving a confusing answer. And it pushed his audience way outside their religious comfort zone. And so that's something that we have to be prepared for when we come to an interaction with the word of God. Like, it, I, it, could Jesus purposefully trying to use the mystery and confusion to push me way outside my comfort zone? And yeah. then what do I do? The, it says that Jesus was aware of their... Um, aware that his disciples were grumbling which kind of uh maybe hints at like they weren't open about about it um it doesn't it doesn't show like the bible doesn't have them clearly coming humbly asking for more for more information and i'm shocked when i read through the gospels how few people like i can think of better questions to ask than what they actually ask right and so, um, but, but they weren't humble enough to ask for an explanation or come closer to him. And this is where I, I, I started using this, this way of speaking. And I use my body in, in my preaching to say like, there's this idea of coming closer and coming and, and then drawing further away. And they did not come closer to Jesus. They distanced themselves from Jesus. Right. And their response was all too familiar. They're like, I'm done. Now, the disciples, the 12, they were also confused. They didn't understand it better. And this is so important. Right. You have these two groups of people. They were both disciples. They were both followers. But one group distanced themselves they were confused and they distanced themselves. One group was confused and they get closer to Jesus. It wasn't that, that Peter got it or understood it or liked the teaching better. You could argue that they were just as confused and just as like annoyed with Jesus. But Peter's like, I don't get it either, but where else can I go? Yeah. Um, and so what you, what you see is that the, the, the 12, they had a desperation that, where they needed Jesus, where the other people, they didn't need, they didn't have that desperation. They were like, okay, we, we're going to be fine on our own. Thank you for the nice teachings, love to the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to be okay on our own. So... Both groups experienced confusion and doubt, but only one group was desperate for Jesus. The other group was fine on their own. And that's where I asked, like, well, what about you? Mm -hmm. Do you have that desperation for Jesus or are you fine on your own? When you come, when it comes to your, your, your relationship with the word of God, um, I can't, it blows my mind when people are like, yeah, I've, I've kind of stopped reading the Bible. I read it. I read it for the first five years of my discipleship. And now I've like, I've already read it. So what do I need to read it anymore for? Right, right. I'm right. like, what? <laughs> That's so, that just shows like, you don't have the desperation. You're fine on your own. And so I, but then I say like, Hey, I, I, I want to pose a question to you. That's very specific and very deliberate in the way I'm, um, I'm, I'm posing it. There's a, there's a hundred ways that you could kind of wrap up this idea into a takeaway, but here's the way, here's the way I did it. I asked the question, do I let my confusion and doubts, because they're, don't, don't assume you don't have it. We all have confusion and doubts, but do I let my confusion and my doubts dictate my obedience? Or do I obey despite confusion and doubts? Right. Do we answer our confusion and doubts with humble counsel, going towards spiritual people, going towards Jesus, going towards our, our relationship with the, the word? Or do the confusion and doubts result in individualism and distance? And so this is where, uh, this is where I kind of brought up 
we've talked about it a few times in the past, but I really wanted to kind of kind of use this point to to discuss it. The idea of deconstruction. People are, you know, young, especially young people. Right. But all over, people are using the idea of deconstruction. And I think in this specific story, we have some deconstruction going on, but we see the two responses and one is wrong and one is right. Yeah. Um, they had, they, they had this understanding of who Jesus was. And then Jesus drops this truth bomb on them, which is like, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everyone's like, hold on. I need to deconstruct. I need to, <laughs> I need to ch ch challenge what I'm believing and thinking about who you are. Right. And one group is like, I'm going to take a step back. And one group is like, I'm going to take a step forward. Yep. And so what I told my church was like, hey, deconstruction should be a regular practice of, of confronting our preconceptions, rebuilding the foundations of our faith. It should, you should be deconstructing all the time. The problem is what I've seen in even a lot of the people I care about very, very deeply is deconstruction has become the process of learning how to be fine all on your own. Mm. And so I just ask people like, you know, you, you have probably have said, oh, I'm going through a season of deconstruction. <laughs> Does that mean I stopped going to church? I stopped reading the Bible. I stopped seeking wise counsel. I stopped building spiritual community. If that's true, then you are like the people that, that left Jesus. Yeah. How is that actually going for you? Like I have close friends and, and people I, I love dearly who that, that was their response. And the problem is I, I, it's not, it didn't go well for them. Right. And so, um, and so the analogy that I use, and I even saw this during COVID, this is something that I, I saw in our church. I saw in our, our last church and I, because of our, our small church group, I feel like this is, this is a lot, something a lot of ministers can relate to, um, you know, whether it was when we went virtual and I think all, a lot of ministers, I know there's people that stopped coming to church and they still haven't seen two and a half years later. Mm -hmm. Um, the analogy is like you're in the water and someone is underwater and they are drowning. And you're like, what you need is up here, <laughs> air. And they just keep swimming down further. And, and it's like, that will kill you. Um, and that's what I feel like when it comes to community yeah. and um, this desperation, like, man, I, like, I don't have the answers, but I know that, that I'll, I'll do better if I go closer to the Bible, if I go closer to a spiritual community, if I go closer to, to Jesus, not, I, I just need to figure it out all on my own. And I, I would even say like the individualism of a lot of what people say is deconstruction, like is, is pretty shocking. Like a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm so flabbergasted when I hear people say like, well, I just need to figure out what I believe about this on my own. Yeah. And I'm like, that, that statement alone is so <clears throat> anti, you know, anti first century biblical community. Like, that would be shocking to say to any one of our, you know, esteemed yeah. Bible brothers and sisters, like they'd be like, who are you? You <laughs> to know, like, who cares what you think about this? Um, but that's just individual versus collectivist stuff that I think is really bad. So that's where I, that's where I ended it. And then at the, at the end, what I, what I, I don't do this all the time, but I did it for this sermon. I did um, just a, a screen with like 
it said the word of God up at the top. Mm -hmm. And then I went through the, the three things and I said, the word of God exposes your pride. The word of God leaves room for mystery. And the word of God walks you through doubt. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's great. And then I just finished up by saying, you know, we, we, re we read these stories of people that had these bad interactions with Jesus. And we read that, this is me just repeating the intro. We, re we read that and we assume we would never mis make the mistakes of those foolish people. But it's easier to see that we might actually have the exact same relationship with the Bible that they had with Jesus. Yeah. And so, uh, and so then that's where I, uh, pretty much just wrapped it up right there. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I love that. You know, I think that that third point, um, I think a lot of people are like, you know, attaching themselves to the idea of deconstruction, but what they're really doing is demolition. And, uh, and those are two different things. And you think about like, if it's a real relationship, which is kind of the focus of this message, and you were deconstructing your marriage, or, you know, like, like, if, you know, maybe you need to step back and think about the, you know, how this relationship is going, how it was formed, but you got to stick with the relationship, um, or you're, and you're actually just ending something, um, and giving it a better name, uh, and so, you know, you get in an argument with your, with your wife, and you can step back and stay distant, or you can close the gap, which is what the disciples did with Jesus, um, and then that actually leads to greater faith um, on the other side of it, greater faithfulness in your marriage or in your walk. With yeah. people. So, I, have you heard of this phenomenon called uh, quiet quitting? Um, kind of part of the anti-work movement. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians have quiet quit. I don't know, like on a work perspective, it sounds like maybe people are just only doing their job and that's called quiet quitting. Um, <laughs> like I'm just going to do my job. Um, but, uh, so I don't totally understand the concept, but I think, you know, quiet quitting with God happens all the time. People quit quietly, um, long before they, they actually leave. Um, and so that's something that I added. I think this is, call, you know, this is the benefit. This is one of the benefits of small churches and you could do a whole thing just on this, but I think having now leading a small church for um, through this, the pandemic and everything, the idea that uh, th there are there are great advantages and strengths to, to being a small church leader. And if we overlook those in the pursuit of being a big church leader someday, <laughs> like like the only the only value we have is that we stop being a small church leader someday. Um, I think we can help our churches through this stuff in a way that, uh, that bigger churches can't. And, and we need to, we need to love that and be totally okay. And, and yeah, we want our churches to grow, but don't throw away all of the amazing opportunities that that leading a small church has while you're leading a small church. Yeah. And so I would just say to all the ministers, like just embrace that. Like you get to do things that you could never do in a big church. Um, relationally teaching wise, that, that influence, that nudging where everybody feels like they know the church leader yeah. uh, on a more intimate basis. Um, and, and while, while you're leading a small church, like you should just soak that up and love it. Yep. And then if you ever, you know, as your church grows, you can figure that out. But that's don't, don't mistake all the opportunities that God is giving you now. Yeah. And I do think that the, even though, you know, you talked about the rudders being small or large, we do get to, I think, change the congregation more quickly, um, when it's small. So have have that influence um and just be a bigger influence in people's lives than maybe a big church has lots of lots more influence and, um from other sources that are coming at people that that we we don't get to see as much um or know about yeah. so 
Personal, keeping it personal, man. Um, that's awesome. Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, super appreciate it. And uh, we'll have to get get your sermon you preached and put it on the, the final YouTube page. I haven't populated that yet, but um, get everybody's OG sermons from this series. So um, that'll be great, but appreciate it. I'm looking forward to preaching it this Sunday. I think I'm going to have to rework some of my notes from some of the insights you gave uh, in this, which is exactly the whole point. Um, so <laughs> it's awesome, man. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, have an awesome day in the UP. Sweet, man. Thank you.